freedom, man. That's what it's all about. You've got to groove on freedom, like the good book says. listening to what on earth is happening this show will discuss the topics of human consciousness mind control natural law the occult and all issues that affect the freedom of the people of earth what on earth is happening will endeavor to shine light upon the darkness of our world and to offer empowering solutions to the problems we face as humanity approaches its critical moment of choice. And now, here is your host, Mark Passio. Welcome one and all, you're listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Today is Saturday, March 2nd, 2013. We have a great podcast lined up for you here today. I'm going to be getting into the topics of organic food today, and I'm going to get into uh, technology a little bit today as a topic I'm going to be talking about planned obsolescence a little bit later on in the show. But I have so many um, uh, notes and event announcements that I want to go over. So much is is happening and going on. I haven't done a podcast in about a month. I've been taking a lot of time uh, reorganizing uh, my priorities, uh, really focusing on getting the Free Your Mind Conference together and making it be the best event that it possibly can be. So we're doing a lot of work on, in the organizational front uh, with uh, regards to the conference. And I, again, as I said last week, I've just been refocusing my efforts and uh, rebalancing myself because for a while there, I feel that I wasn't being effective in what I was doing. And uh, in order to do that, I wanted to take a step back so I did that for a little while and um, again the the podcast may again come at a a rate that is less frequent as they've been right now and uh, at some point I may start ramping them up and doing them in a very regular fashion again but for now I think uh, you know I'm going to pace them out and um, uh, put a lot of material together that I want to talk about and come forward with it strongly instead of doing it in small batches. And again, the organization for the conference is taking the bulk of the priority of my time right now as the conference approaches rapidly now, coming up in April. So let's jump right into uh, the event announcements and uh, I want to go over a few um, short notes and comments that I have here. Uh, and talk about some uh, issues that are going on in the modern world. And then I want to get into our uh, dual topic today of the state of organic food. And I want to talk about planned obsolescence when it comes to technology. So the Free Your Mind 2 conference, of course, rapidly approaching, coming up April 25th, 26th, and 27th here in the city of Philadelphia. Free Your Mind 2 is a conference on consciousness, mind control, and the occult. The location is the beautiful Arch Street Meeting House in the historic district of Philadelphia at 320 Arch Street. The featured speakers, Alan Steinfeld, Alfred Weber, Andrew Bashago, Ben Stewart, Bob Tuscan, Kathy O'Brien, Curtis Davis, Dr. Dream, Freighter X, Freeman Fly, Fritz Springmeyer, Jan Irvin, Jay Parker, 
Jim Fetzer, Larkin Rose, Laura Eisenhower, Lennon Honor, Loren Moray, myself, Mark Passio, Mark Phillips, Marty Leeds, Randall Carlson, Ross Ben, and Sonia Barrett. An all-star lineup to be sure. It's just going to be such a phenomenal event. Really looking forward to it. The best way that you could support this conference is to buy an advanced ticket. Advanced ticket sales are only going to be uh, through the end of this month. Uh, April 1st will be the last day for advanced ticket sales. You, you have to have your, um, your envelope postmarked April 1st, or we're, we're not going to honor advanced ticket sales beyond that. So April 1st is the last day for uh, advanced prices, advanced ticket prices for the Free Your Mind Conference. The Free Your Mind Conference is also going to feature a healing arts expo on Friday and Saturday, days two and three, in the uh, the West Room uh, I'm sorry, the East Room of the uh, the venue of the uh, Art Street House. And we're going to have um, vendors in there uh, for all kinds of uh, healing arts and um, uh, powerful information as well from uh, local activist groups. So you'll definitely want to check that out when you're at the Free Your Mind Conference. And the advanced ticket prices... Very reasonably priced, $30 for the conference on Thursday, $20 for the meet and greet on Thursday evening, also featuring a concert, a theremin concert by the Divine Hand Ensemble, $40 for the Friday conference, $40 for the Saturday conference, and for the all-conference special, all three days plus the speaker meet and greet and theremin concert featuring the Divine Hand, only $120 for the whole package. For more speaker information, speaker bios and photos, and for ticketing information, please visit the conference website, www.freeyourmindconference.com. To support the goals of the Free Your Mind Conference, we'll be throwing the fourth and final fundraiser for the Free Your Mind 2 Conference. On March 30th, 2013, it will be an online, all-day radio marathon right on the Free Your Mind Conference website website freeyourmindconference.com you'll be able to tune into the radio stream march 30th 2013 from noon to midnight eastern the um radio marathon fundraiser fundraiser number four for the free your mind two conference is going to be uh hosted by bob tuscan freeman fly myself and the illuminated one curtis davis for co-hosts of the uh, Free Your Mind 2 fundraiser number 4 radio marathon on freeyourmindconference.com. Be sure to tune into that from noon to midnight Eastern Time on March 30th. We'll be interviewing a bunch of speakers from the conference and um, we'll also be doing some uh, prize giveaways as well on the air. So definitely check that out and support the conference goals and let me tell you something folks a conference of this size uh, and magnitude does not just throw itself it takes a lot of time effort work resources money all of it and people are putting this work uh, in out of the kindness of their hearts because they want to see humanity be free and they're putting hundreds of hours of work into this uh, endeavor for free so please help us uh, support the conference and um, help us to pay the travel expenses of a lot of these phenomenal speakers that we're bringing in and it's, it's quite expensive to do that to bring speakers in from all over the country especially uh, you know with many speakers needing uh, travel arrangements made to be flown into Philadelphia and to be lodged in the city for uh, a four-day duration because many of them are coming in on the day before the conference begins and then staying for the three days uh, of the conference's duration. So, check. please do check out that fundraiser on March 30th right at freeyourmindconference.com. Also coming up in March, I'm going to be releasing two new videos on the What on Earth is Happening.com website and the uh, What on Earth is Happening YouTube channel. I will be releasing uh, videos of uh, presentations that I gave over the last couple of months. One of them was at the Pencil Pennsylvania MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network East Coast Conference. 
and I gave a talk at that conference called Morality and Disclosure. It'll be the first public video that I've posted relating to uh, extraterrestrial phenomena and some of my takes on that. So I'm sure it'll be uh, very much uh, looked forward to by some people who want to hear my take on that. I don't get too deep into, um, you know, speculation. It's really about the moral issues that are involved in the ongoing cover-up. So that is coming out, that will be coming out on March 20th, along with another video, a shorter video that I did as part of the Tesla Memorial Conference called Why Tesla Matters in New York. Uh, in um, January, and um, at that conference I gave a talk called Scarcity to Abundance, which was really about why free energy technologies have not manifested themselves in our world, and why we're still stuck in an energy paradigm that is based upon scarcity and the depletion of the Earth's resources. And it's about the, the mindset that is holding us back toward the manifestation of free energy, holding us back from the manifestation of free energy, I should say. So that's what I got in, into that in that lecture. So two, two presentations uh, coming up, both filmed by um, Tim Smith of um, Signs of the Time Media, and he did a great job on the filming and put uh, spliced in the... Um, the uh, presentation slides into the video. He, he was the gentleman who also put together the uh, Matrix Trilogy Decoded video, uh, which he, I think he did a great job with that as well. So these two new videos will be hitting the website on March 20th. I decided to do that deliberately uh, on the spring equinox. So look for those in the next couple of weeks. Also, uh, a new project that I am looking to put together here in Philadelphia. I want to uh, mention this to find out if there is anyone in the Philadelphia area that might be able to help me to uh, manifest this. I have been considering, um, instead of just uh, simple presentations, putting together more intensive seminars um, that deal with natural law and human rights and what true freedom really is and what sovereignty really is. And doing it in a form of a uh, all-day workshop, something like that, or maybe not even necessarily an all-day workshop, but maybe, you know, like a, a, a six-hour workshop with, you know, uh, you know a three-hour session, a break, and then another three-hour session, something like that, um, at a local venue somewhere in Philadelphia or in the suburbs of Philadelphia, just outside of Philly someplace, I posted to my Facebook page this idea, got a lot of positive response, but still trying to find a venue for this. I actually also contacted the uh, folks from um, Citizens for Liberty, an activist group. Uh, I'm going to talk about it with some people at Truth, Freedom, Prosperity, and find out if there's some place maybe we can do this where, you know, we have um, like a classroom environment and it would be like, uh, you know, attending a class or a seminar on natural law and really going over the basics, even having maybe handouts for people and, uh, you know, bringing this information to people in a face-to-face -face setting instead of just talking about it over the radio on the internet with some slides, you know, doing it in a face-to-face -face setting and making it somewhat interactive, working with people, working them through their mental blocks to what natural law is really about and what sovereignty is all about and true freedom. And, you know, looking at scenarios, looking at specific examples, things like that. So if anyone in the Philadelphia area, again, please limit this to the Philadelphia area. If you know of a good venue that we can do this at that would house maybe you know 30 or 40 people something like that and would be open to allowing something like this and uh you know we could do this maybe over you know maybe even over a couple of month period maybe like do it like uh one night a week for um or one day a week you know in the afternoon or something for you know a month you know, I'm willing to break it up into sessions even. 
if anybody um, has a venue in mind, please contact me at mark at what on earth is happening dot com. And again, it has to be local to Philadelphia. I'm not looking for something outside the city to do this. I want something in this area that's easy for me to travel to and set up at and, you know, basically teach an intensive course, an intensive workshop or seminar on natural law. So uh, that being said, let's move on to another uh, event announcement. On March 28th, we will be having the Truth, Freedom, Prosperity monthly uh, free documentary screening and discussion night uh, at Essene Food Market on 4th and Monroe Streets in Philadelphia. And this will be the last time that this meetup will be happening at Essene. Uh, the last Thursday of the month is when we host these. We've been doing them at Essene Food Market, but we're going to be switching the venue. Uh, this past month we just showed the first in a four-part series. It's called Occult History of the Third Reich, a phenomenal documentary series that explains the occult underpinnings of the uh, Nazi ideology and agenda. And for people that don't understand that Nazism was a solar cult, it was a cult of, of the dark sun, the black sun, the Schwartz sun, as the inner occult order in the Nazi movement referred to it as. If people don't understand that this was an occult ideology that drove the Third Reich, uh, you just are still asleep. You know, and if people don't understand that this is the same solar cult that's still ruling us today, um, you just don't get what's really going on. So, we really got into a good discussion and a good um, bringing forward of a lot of the key players in the occult underworld, you know, that, that put together the, the Nazi regime and the Third Reich and are the, the, these same ideologies, of course, you know, not the same exact people. They passed down their ideologies to their successors, of course. But the uh, same ideologies are at work in our world today. And one could say that we are in the Fourth Reich. So um, we're going to be continuing the, the series that we started uh, this past Thursday. We did it on February 28th at a scene. And uh, we showed the first part of this four-part series. It was called uh, Occult History of the Third Reich, Part 1, The Enigma of the Swastika. And it got into the symbolism that drove the Third Reich's mentality. Uh, part 2 is going to delve into the Schutzstaffel, the SS, the Protection Squadron, uh, Hitler's secret police, um, and their ideologies. And how that was really based on dark, esoteric occultism. As was really, as I said, the entire Third Reich. Uh, it was a solar cult, and again, their successors are really the people who are behind the Fourth Reich, which is dominating our world today. So, come on out to a scene on March 28th for part two of this four-part series. And then there are uh, two more parts that we're going to be, we'll, we'll be picking up the second half of this documentary series when we move the uh, TFP documentary night to Underground Arts at 12th and Callow Hill Streets. That'll be coming up in April and May. I'll have to move the date on the one in April because, of course, the uh, last Thursday of April is the beginning of the Free Your Mind conference. So I think I'll move it to the uh, the week before in April, or maybe we'll skip April altogether and start them in in um, May at Underground Arts. I'll have to see how hectic uh, the uh, uh, the mid part and end part of April actually is. Okay. I attended the Second Amendment rally that was hosted by the group called Citizens for Liberty, an activist group in the Norristown, Pennsylvania area. I attended uh, the Second Amendment rally that they threw. It was called Gun Owners Against Crime. And this took place on February 23rd, 223. 
And it was awesome. I mean, uh, they really did a great job. Um, great speakers. Uh, 200 people turned out with their weapons. And there was tons of people with battle rifles in the street standing for the Second Amendment saying, we will not be disarmed. And I thought it was very, very encouraging. Anybody that has been following the work I've been doing on the Second Amendment and just, you know, the inherent natural law right to defend oneself, inherently defend one's, you know, the inherent right to defend oneself against violence, uh, will know I'm a huge supporter of gun ownership rights. And I feel that whenever um, a society is enslaved, it has to be disarmed first for it to be truly enslaved. And that's why they want a gun grab agenda to be put into effect here in the United States because they want to take away people's right to defend themselves against tyranny. Anybody that doesn't understand that's what guns and gun ownership are for, again, you're still asleep and you need to wake up and understand that the Second Amendment is not in place to protect uh, just your right to defend your home or to hunt in the wilderness, um, which, again, I don't. I don't even look at it as a moral use of firearms uh, because I'm not for hunting or sport or game or eating dead animal flesh. Uh, but I do deeply understand that firearms are for someone's protection of their freedom when someone else is encroaching against their freedom. That's what they're for. Make no mistake about it. And let me tell you something, the people who showed up at this rally understand that fact. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. That's why the Second Amendment was ever put into place, to protect an inherent natural right that exists in creation. And the people there understand, very encouraging, that they understand those rights don't come from man, they come from the creator of the universe, and they are not going to sit and idly buy and watch those rights be taken by any man when they weren't granted by any man. So I just want to say uh, to the uh, organizers of that rally, excellent job. Keep up the great work. And, um, you know, it was an inspiring day for me. And I don't say that very much when I meet with large groups of people. But um, uh, that was encouraging. Let's just put it that way. So, the feedback so far for the new podcast format has been very good, very encouraging, uh, much better than I thought it would be. I thought people would, you know, uh, miss the old radio format, but uh, every single person that wrote to me, bar none, I couldn't even believe it myself, said that they thought I made the right decision, I made the right move, were, were glad that I had parted ways with Oracle, and that they supported the new podcast format, and not one person who, who donated for the uh, ad-free chip-in uh, asked for their money back, and everybody said, please put it into what you feel is appropriate. So what I did with part of it, and I still have uh, plenty left over that I'm going to do more things with, but um, I bought a mixer. Um, it's a simple uh, six-channel audio mixer. And I bought a um, new condenser microphone. So hopefully that quality comes through in the podcast. Uh, I don't know whether you know people will hear a radical difference. I'm hoping it, it does come through. I did a couple of other interviews uh, recently, and I think it did come through rather well on those interviews from listening back to the audio quality. I was kind of happy with uh, you know the quality that I got out of this new microphone uh, so far. So um, the money is being put to good use and will continue to be. And uh, thanks for all the positive feedback that uh, people have given me on the new podcast format. I want to make a couple of uh, uh, announcements about some uh, shows that I was on recently. I was interviewed by Gary Hendershot on Wide Awake News on Monday, February 25th. And I got into mind control and occultism and natural law a little bit on the show. Gary is on the uh, Wide Awake News Network. It's the same network that Charlie McGrath broadcasts out of. And um, it was a good show. That's up in the What on Earth is Happening News section. I was also interviewed on Awake in the Dream Radio, the uh, podcast put out by um, 
Dr. Dream and Laura Eisenhower, two of the featured speakers at the Free Your Mind conference. They also interviewed me on February 25th. Uh, the, po- the podcast was actually broadcast the next day on the 26th on their um, uh, radio channel, their podcast channel. We got into natural law, self-ownership. Um, we I talked a little bit about the sacred masculine principle of the inherent right to uh, use... Uh, force in a defensive capacity, the right to self-defense. We got into a lot of other topics as well. Check that out. That is also in the news section of um, whatonearthishappening.com. Um, last week I made, uh, or last podcast I should say, I made some comments that uh, I don't really particularly like humanity. I don't really like people in general. And some people took that the wrong way or commented that, well, when you say that, people who are hearing what you're saying in your podcast read into that and say, well, you don't like me. And my answer to that kind of is, I don't have to like you for the information that I'm saying to be true. You don't have to like me for the information that I'm saying to be true. Um I, I kind of stress over and over and over again that for, for people to understand the non-aggression principle, you don't even really have to like each other. Uh, you could even find someone completely distasteful and still exercise the non-aggression principle, not commit violence, you know, and undue force against them. So um, the whole thing of having to like somebody or even trying to project that you like them is, is to me, um, it's like the new age hooks that are in people. And I'm going to really be getting into this in the fr- at my speech at the Free Your Mind conference. My uh my presentation at the Free Your Mind conference is going to totally tear apart the new age movement. That's what the whole thing is going to be on. All of the deceptions and falsities that are in the new age mentality. And one of these things is that you have to talk in sweet, pleasing tones to people and appeal to their ego and, uh, you know, try to, try to um, you know, sweet talk them. And that's not what I'm about. That's not what I've ever been about since day one. I'm not going to pretend that that's what I'm about or that's what I'm like. Uh, I've been very open and honest. I told people from day one I'm not an apologist for humanity. Um, I don't think that humanity is evil by its nature. I think it has become sick and pretty much become destroyed. That's not its nature. You know, that's basically what they we've allowed to happen to ourselves in our ignorance and apathy and lack of will. And, you know, my comment from last podcast stands, I don't really like human beings. I don't like what human beings have become. And again, I'm not doing this for human beings. I don't know how much clearer I could be on that and more honest and open about it I can be. I'm doing this because I'm charged to put truth out into the world so the people who choose to do so may learn and change their ways. That's it. That's why I do what I do. Not because I like anyone. I love truth. I love freedom. And I'm putting these words out and these teachings out to protect those things. Because I'm on the side of those forces. I'm their servant. I'm not humanity's servant. And I'll, you know, I'll keep re-emphasizing that as needed. But um, I just you know, wanted to put that forward once again for people th- that you know, are worried. Well, people will hear you say that and th- they won't listen. Well, don't. Don't listen. Shut the podcast off right now, as a matter of fact. I'm not concerned with who does or does not listen to this show. If I wanted a ton of people to listen to this show, I would not be telling people things that they don't want to hear. I would try to appeal to their ego and tell them everything's going to be fine. You know, the, the uh, you know, the, the, um... Uh, Starfleet force from uh, uh, you know Andromeda is coming any day now. No action is required, and just sit tight, and it's all going to be taken care of. That's what people want to hear. You know, people who put that crap out on their uh, you know information-based websites uh, or 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 radio shows get hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people tuning into their 
junk because that's what people want to hear. I don't need to do anything. I don't need to really change myself or anything about who I am or what I think or what I do. You know, somebody else has got this in hand. The Savior's coming to rescue us from ourselves. Yeah, keep waiting. Let me know how that works out for you. You know, that's what people want to hear. People don't want to hear what I'm saying because it, it's telling them massive change is required that starts with the way you think. Well, good luck selling that to anybody. You know, only the people who are ready to hear that message and what it entails are going to come here and listen to this information. So, you know, the, uh, uh, this isn't a popularity contest, nor is it meant to be. This is here for people who are serious students of the occult, the hidden forces at work in our world, and how to change the world and create a better reality. For serious students of that, that's what this whole show is and has been about and will continue to be about. So, you know, I stand by the comment, I don't like people. When people change, maybe I'll like them a little bit better. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop what I'm doing. Because the truth remains the truth, and that's the force I serve. So, people also commented on the aspect last week of vitriolic speech. And a lot of people say that doesn't work. You know, you get more flies with uh, honey than you do with vinegar. And my retort to that is it's never been tried in mass. Never been tried in mass. People speaking the truth totally unapologetically, right to someone's face, and calling people on their own bullshit. It's ne never been tried. It's never been done. If you could show me an instance in history where it has been done, I'd like to see it, and I'd like to see you document it. Because, to my knowledge, it's never even been tried, let alone been done. So, if more people spoke the truth and actually called other people on their crap, things might change. But unfortunately, most people are too timid to do that. They're too afraid of what other people think of them. You know? They care more about somebody else's opinion of them than what the truth is. And they, they think that they're going to baby spoon feed this to people. And it'll take 10,000 years for somebody to get the ABCs of this. Well, we don't have time for that, ladies and gentlemen. We haven't had time for that. You know? So, I also stand by my contention that more people need to put this boldly and even rashly into the face of people who continue to support human slavery and explain to them what they're helping. Help them see it in a clear way, even if they're not ready to hear that truth. Make them see it. Hold a mirror up to their face and force them to see it. It's never been done. It's never been tried because people are too timid to even try it. So, you know, I think where we're at in the, the level of transgression that we have fallen into as a species, sweet-talking people is not the answer. That's going to make people think that what they are doing and have been continuing to do is okay, which it is not. So I like the vitriolic approach, and I have no intention of changing it. I think it's more effective when people hear when somebody is righteously outraged by what other people are doing and the way that they are thinking that is destructive to the ends of freedom and justice in our world. I think that has much more effect than being timid and shy and, oh, you might want to look at how you think about this. No. Be bold. Get up in people's faces with the truth. That's why the lie is totally dominating the world. Because it's bold and in people's face. You know, and the lie speaks to people with a sweet voice. You know, it tells them what they want to hear and pats them on the head and people fall into it. They love it. They can't get enough of it. You know, you, you, you look at a, a, a television news program. These people all get dressed up and do their hair so nicely and they dress in their suit and their business suit and, you know, they get up there and, you know, they tell people a whole crock of dung is what they do. Poisonous, 
sewage comes out of their mouth that, that can only do bad things that are destructive to human beings. But they tell people it with a pleasing voice and a nice smile on the face. You know, a nice crap-eating grin on the face. And people just eat it up with a spoon and, and slurp it up with a straw. Well, I think the approach toward telling the truth should not be like that. We need to get up in people's face with the truth so that they can not refuse to see it. So that it will be put up there and spoken in a totally unapologetic manner by those who know. And that's all the universe is asking us to do. It's not asking us to make that decision for other people as to whether it's to accept the truth or not. It's asking us to tell people how it really is. And then their karma is whether to accept it or not. So I'm not interested in sweet-talking anyone. People say I do a lot of browbeating. You're damn right I do. The truth remains the truth no matter how it's said to people. It can be, again, whispered in your ear by a, a, a soft-spoken seductress. Or it can be shouted through a bullhorn by a guy with a loud, raspy voice it, three inches from your ear. It, nothing's going to change except your reaction or receptivity to it. That's it. And that's all in the ego. That's all rooted in the ego, my friends. Whether you hear someone screaming at the top of their lungs, 2 plus 2 equals 4, just because you don't like how the message de is delivered makes no difference as to the veracity of the message, whether it is true or not. And that's all that ultimately matters. And yes, that is all that ultimately matters, is whether it is true or not. Not how it is spoken, and not even whether it is received or not. Again, that is the individual's karma that wants to reject truth. That's not my business. That's your business. That's their business. It's, it's each individual's business, whether they want to recognize and understand what's really going on and come onto the side of the truth and be a part of that, the unfolding of that force or whether they want to keep doing the same thing that they've done and keeping the truth suppressed. The ego has everything to do with the perception of information. So, I totally am not for the method of placating the ego. The ego has to be broken down. And that's, vitriol means acid. Acid wears things away. It makes things become dissolved. The ego needs to be dissolved. The force that doesn't want people to admit truth, that doesn't want people to admit that they are wrong. That's the egoic mind. We are not doing anyone any service by approaching people with this new age attitude of if everything is good. No, everything is not good. There is good and there is evil. There is right and there is wrong. The, the, a lot of this New Age bunk teaching moral relativism, I'm so sick of it. There's no such thing as right or wrong. Those are divisive. Those are dualistic. Bullshit. Okay? And I call you on that bullshit. It's nonsense. This is, this is moral relativistic nonsense put out by occultists who are behind new a, a lot of New Age teachings. Dark occultists. And you have to understand that there's a big deception going on with a lot of the information that's being put out by this community that doesn't even understand the myth, the, the total lie of authority. They, 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 they'll still tell you with a straight face people in the, this movement that there's such a thing as political authority and jurisdiction and, you know, the, the, the claims of ownership made by other people on you are valid. They won't talk about sovereignty because they're cowards. They're cowards. No, they won't talk about sovereignty because that challenges Big Daddy, you know, and his bullwhip. 
We can't, we can't do that. These people disgust me. They're cowards and they're deceivers. So, look forward to a scathing presentation at the Free Your Mind Conference on the New Age Movement from me. Again, that's going to be my topic. Breaking down the deception and lies of the New Age Movement. Um, another thing I want to comment on is that I constantly, constantly hear this statement over and over again when I you know, see people maybe discussing the information that I put forward on the internet, I hear the phrase, well, there's nothing new here. He's not telling anybody anything radically new or, you know, uh, that this is so, you know, earth-shattering in, it, in its differentness than other things that I've heard before. Yeah, who, who claimed that it was? When did I ever make the claim, I'm going to bring forward so much new stuff that no one in the world has ever heard before, you know, radically new concepts that, you know, uh, you, you'll have no idea what I'm even talking about at first, you know. When did I ever make that claim that I had brand new information? There's nothing new. You, you ever hear the phrase, folks, there's nothing new under the sun? Nothing new is going on here on the earth. It's all the same old crap. There's nothing new. Same crap, different day. Slavery going on on the earth. What, what new information am I going to bring forward that hasn't already been said or heard a billion or more times? I'm a collector of information. And I organize it into a stepwise progression that is digestible, that is more readily and easily digestible by people so that they can process it in a linear sequential progression. That is the point of what on earth is happening. Not to bring up anything new, because there I couldn't bring up anything new. There is nothing new for me to bring up. The information that I deal with is timeless. It is cosmic in nature. It is inherent to the fabric of reality. That's it. So how are you going to make something new from that? You know, it's just, it's people who are just morons. I mean, let's just call these people what they are. They're idiots. They're morons. They're brain dead. They don't understand the concept that there's nothing new under the sun. They don't get that. They don't understand what that phrase even means. You know, and they, they think, oh, well, because I just, I'm, I'm just starting my awakening, oh, I, I'm going to go here and it's going to present something so radically different and new to me that I've never heard before. Well, don't, don't necessarily expect that. Maybe you will learn something new. Maybe you won't from what I'm saying. But I never claimed that I was presenting anything new. I never even claimed that this was my information to begin with because it isn't. This information is the birthright of humanity. Period. It's the birthright of free beings everywhere. Not even just humanity. So, you know, I never made that claim that I present new information. So I don't know where this concept even comes from or why people expect that I'm putting forward anything new. When I go and listen to a researcher online, I don't expect him to put out new information. I want to hear his take on what's really going on, which is the same thing that's always been going on here, at least since human beings have been here. And it's called slavery. The only thing that would be new is if we got out of it. Got out of our self-imposed chains. So, to all the people who make this ass-brained comment, there's nothing new here. All I have to say is, wonderful work, genius, brainiac. You figured it out. There's nothing new here. Exactly. Great detective work. I'm very proud of you. So, let's uh, jump to a different topic. Um, before we get into the main two topics that I really want to talk about. Big news. Two big pieces of news. And, I, you know, I have to at least put some kind of a mention uh, uh, on the show, on the podcast, about these two pieces of news. The Pope resigned. I mean, this, you know, never happens. I mean, this is huge in the world of organized religion. 
uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to say much about it other than, you know, whoever doesn't think that this has something huge to do with child pedophilia, with pedophilia and, uh, you know, crimes against children in some form or fashion, again, that's an incredibly naive point of view. Uh, there's no way the Pope is resigning from his post, okay, unless something gigantic is in the un undercurrents and guaranteed it has to do with sex crimes in the Vatican. Guaranteed. I mean, and that's my whole take on that. And uh, anybody with half a brain in their head has to realize that's got to be what this is about. So I'll throw that speculation out there, even though obviously that's not proven as of right now. Uh, we know enough about his history, you know, involved in the cover-up of sex crimes and moving, um, you know, uh, the um, parishioners of certain parishes to other parishes to go and do the same crimes against children in other places where they, they weren't known. And work with families behind the scenes, giving them, you know, payment settlements to settle out of court so they wouldn't bring up these priests on charges. It's disgusting what this pederast cover-up, cover-upper, at the very least, if not a pederast himself, has been doing throughout his, his history, his uh, career in organized religion. So, and, you know, whoever's offended by that, go right ahead and get as offended as you want about you know, your nonsensical, esoteric version of Christian, exoteric, excuse me, version of Christianity, which has nothing to do with true Christianity. Um, that having been said, I mean, that's really all I want to say about the Pope's resignation. If you call it a resignation or an abdication, whatever you want to look at that as. Um, the meteor that exploded over Russia, also something I just want to briefly touch on. Uh, very rare that any human being see something like that in their lifetime and live. Um, to have one that's just that size, that it will explode, detonate, and maybe just hurt some people as opposed to, you know, making a gigantic crater where there used to be a city. So that's an event that usually scientists say maybe happens every 200 years or so. And... Um, you know, we probably won't see something like that in our lifetime. But another uh, possibility that that could be, uh, you know, the goddess herself, you know, nature herself, uh, you know, giving us a little shot across the bow, if you will, a little warning shot, saying, you know, keep keep uh, going with your immoral ways, and you know, I'm going to send the big one next. I'm going to send the big knuckleball right down the middle of the plate next. So, you know, that's that's my take on that is, you know, as things become more destabilized in consciousness here, we're going to see more and more de instability in, in Earth changes and events that happen, cosmic events that happen from space. Uh, to me, it's no surprise, uh, but nonetheless, uh, phenomenally majestic uh, in its awesomeness to see that meteor come screaming through the Earth's atmosphere at the speed that it did and then explode in the uh, lower atmosphere. Uh, just an awesome act of nature itself. That's my take on, on that uh, recent news. So, those are all the uh, events and uh, minor news items, or major news items, if you will, that I wanted to cover. The two topics I really want to briefly talk about here today, and I probably won't make this a long podcast, and again, this is more of a stream of consciousness type podcast. I don't have a like a formal slideshow prepared today about any of this stuff. I just wanted to come on, give an update, talk about a couple of topics that have been on my mind recently, and uh, you know, go from there. Maybe we'll do some more structured podcasts coming up in, in the near future. But you know, for now, I just want to have like a kind of a stream of consciousness, you know, uh, talk about uh, the the state of organic food and the the state of some technology in our world. Uh, th these are topics that I've been encountering and wrestling with over the last many months. And the first thing is the costs of food in general, not just organic food, but all food. If people aren't paying attention, I mean, you you look at the prices at the grocer 
grocery stores and at the supermarkets and it's just out of hand. Food prices are completely out of hand and this is part of, you know, how they basically degenerate a society by uh, restricting access to good, high nutrient dense foods and forcing people in lower class strata to compromise and buy foods that are more adulterated and therefore their thinking becomes degenerated because they're not nourishing their body properly. I mean, it's very simple to understand the cycle and the agenda behind it to keep high quality and low cost foods off the market, both simultaneously, high quality and low cost. And that being said, I mean, the quality of organic food isn't even how it used to be even as recently as a couple of years ago. It's just uh, corners are being cut. Uh, farmers are like doing some of the same types of practices of, you know, picking things too early, uh, obviously not nourishing the crop enough. And it, it's just, you can just see even in the organic produce items, there is has been a, uh, to my perception, a degradation in the quality of avail- available foods. And the, the prices that they're charging for them are completely outrageous. You know, I don't make a lot of money. Um, the, largely, the, you know, Barb uh, brings in the bulk of the um, uh, Federal Reserve notes, you know, compared to the two of us. I, I do independent work uh, with computers. But, I mean, it's so difficult to even um, have enough money left over for food prices, you know, once basic utility costs for for a house are taken into consideration, um, to even eat high quality foods, to, to continue to shop organic and high quality. And we continue to do it, but it's like, you know, very it's very uh, painful to do it because you see the toll that it takes on funds for any given period of time or any given month. I can imagine what people who have are even less fortunate and make even less have to settle for. And this brings me to the topic of organic food in general because I want to talk about the fact that this the prices on organic items are totally artificially driven up. Anybody that wants to, you know, be an apologist for these organic farmers who want to keep trying to present the argument that, oh, you know, this costs so much more to produce, and uh, if you're serious about your health, you'll be gladly willing to pay a premium. They're full of crap. Uh, Let's just come out and say it just openly and honestly. These people are just all about the money. And I, I've touched on this before when it comes to like organic grocery stores like Whole Foods, you know, and Trader Joe's to a lesser extent. Trader Joe's pr- prices are fairly reasonable. Whole Foods' prices are so out of control, I don't even know what to, to tell you. You know, and look, I, I'm, I do the monthly documentary screenings at a scene and this next month is going to be the last one so you know i don't really even care uh their prices are so over the top at a food store like that i can't even believe people go and shop there and it's all done because they feel they can get away with it all these organic grocery stores feel that they could just get away with the rape just completely price gouging people who know that they're being poisoned want have a desire to eat more healthy and they're going to put out the organic food as an alternative and it's price fixing and price gouging in cahoots with the food ma- producers the farmers and the food packagers all of them p- together the food processors manufacturers farmers and the food stores the retailers Th- there's no effective actual reason that Organic food needs to be priced the way that it is in comparison to conventional. Even if you said, okay, there's growing techniques, I can understand that, and I know people who are involved in growing food. And I can tell you, the price justifications are nowhere near reality of what they're claiming they need to jack up these prices to. I could even see a small markup from the conventional stuff because of the growing techniques. I understand that. And I, I don't want to hear from people that are going to 
you know, go on tirades about, oh, this has grown this way and that's what justifies all this extra expense. I understand that some of the growing techniques will fetch a slightly higher price, but not the prices that you're seeing in stores when you go into organic grocery stores. I'm sorry. You're not going to sell me that. I'm not buying it. This is price gouging because they have no competition. If you had competition for organic grocery stores, organic venues, organic produce places that you could go to and get organic produce, if you had tons of competition in major cities, there was no way that they would keep those prices up that high. Impossible. It's because they have very little competition, because the demand isn't as high as it should be because people are largely concerned about the price. People aren't shopping for their health. They're shopping to get as much food as they can on as little amount of money as they can. That's how most people shop. That's the harsh reality. And, you know, I watch these YouTube videos about people who say it's so easy. You know, the, these, these new age, burnt-brained morons is all I can eat. I don't even want to be nice about it. I don't even want to be nice about it because they have such a skewed version of reality in their mind. They have such a skewed worldview about what they think is going on in the world because they live out in an area, maybe in Southern California, where there's organic produce stores everywhere and there is a lot of competition, so prices are probably lower there, and that's where they're largely being grown so they don't have to truck them across the country to the East Coast. Come out here on the East Coast and tell, make a YouTube video for me about how easy it is to eat organic at low prices. Okay? Because you're, you're joking yourself. These people live in a fantasy world and see the world through rose-colored glasses all, all day long. They're living in a fantasy, new age uh, drug culture. The, cu the, new, the new age movement is their drug. That's their drug culture, and they're, they're wasted out of their mind on, on the New Age stuff of bliss everywhere, and the world is such a wonderful place because I could get groceries at three times cheaper than they're sold on the East Coast because they don't have to be trucked out there. But uh, because I'm ignorant to that fact, uh, I'm, I just exist in bliss and make YouTube videos about how easy it is to eat cheap organic on the cheap. You're, you're, you're pranksters. You're joking yourself, Okay. Completely. That, that's, that's all I can say about these people. You know, to, and to put it very harshly. You know, get into the real world and see what's really going on. Not just what's going on around you. That's the problem. People have no global view of what's actually going on. They only see their little microcosm, and that's all. Forget it. Let's just shut it off right there. You know, no need to expand beyond that and find out what's going on in the rest of the world. Just in our, the little microcosm. It's so typical of Americans in general. Of just people in general, but per Americans in particular. You know, so... I don't understand where these people get this from. Or w what their salary is like, what they're making... You know, because, I, you know, I live like a pauper working independently and have to, you know, scrounge and scrape for everything I do. And, you know, they're talking about how easy it is to eat organic on the cheap. Uh, please, if anyone can, can do this in the Philadelphia area, let me know where you're going to get your produce. You know, and, um, uh, you know, people talk about food co-ops and to, to be quite honest... I'm not saying it's not a good idea. What I am saying is I, I, I've visited them in the past and I really do not like the, the, the ideologies of a lot of the people that are there because they're, it's, it's a very... And I'm not saying food shouldn't be openly shared and, you know, uh, co-ops are not a good thing. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in the co-ops that I've seen around Philadelphia, it has been largely people with a Marxist political ideology. Who is, are running them and going to them. In the brief um, interactions I've had and conversations I've had with people that are part of them. And, you know, I just look at these people as completely asleep. And which is why I don't really want to get involved in working with them in a any kind of a um, personal capacity. Even working with the co-op on a monthly basis. A co-op is something I'm not really looking for. Uh, you know... I'm not saying I'm completely closed-minded to it, to trying it, but 
I would rather uh, go toward a farmer's market solution or just smaller grocery stores that have some more reasonable prices, which I have not been able to find that, that carry anything that's organic. You know, you go into uh, markets in South Philadelphia, like, for instance, the Ninth Street Market, what's traditionally been called the Italian Market here in the city in South Philadelphia, which is walking distance from where my home is in South Philadelphia. And it is just uh, conventional, you know, sprayed junk. I mean, it is, you know, food with laden with chemicals and pesticides and herbicides, uh, you know, all, all kinds of uh, poisons for the physiology. I'm not interested in produce like that. I want things, I'm concerned with how it is grown, with what is used to grow it. I don't want chemical additives or fertile, you know, ke chemical additives used in the fertilizer. I don't want... Uh, you know, things to added to it to make it stay on a shelf longer. These are poisons for the body, and I don't want them in my body. I want purity in the f fruits and vegetables that I buy. So, w one of the things I wanted to stress, I mean, you know, if, hey, if anybody has any solutions as to where to get reasonably priced organic produce that doesn't break your wallet, you know, in one bag of groceries, which is what the, the stores in this area do, please I, let me know. I, I, again, I'm willing, I'm you know, open-minded to hearing some, someplace new and to tr trying it out. I don't really have much hope because I've researched and I don't see very much. I, you know, I, I hear about a couple of farmer's markets. There's an a, a Amish farmer's market that happens a block away from my house in the spring and summer that I visit every week and get a ton of stuff from them. And I, I have no problem with them. And I talk to them about the methods that they use for growing. And, you know, they use... Uh, uh, it, what, it's what you would call... It's not uh, legally certified organic, but it's essentially organic methods that are used. They're, they just haven't been certified by an agency. So I support Amish farmers' markets in general. But... Um, definitely open to hearing any new suggestions when it comes to that. What I, the main thing I wanted to stress here is that please don't confuse people's willingness to grow food in an ecologically and health-wise responsible manner with any kind of true hum humanitarian reasons. They're in this for the business more than they are for the health or, you know, ecological reasons. They're in this to make money. And as such, they are seizing on a market. They are capitalizing on a market that they can rush in and seize at a very high price. Command a high price. Because they know they have no competition and they know people are forced into a corner. And they love it. They love that. They don't want anything to change when it comes to that. They're not interested in trying to have more competition. Th these are essentially immoral individuals. Because God, their God is that dollar bill. That's what it's all about, folks. M please don't fall into the naivete of believing that these organic farmers are some wonderful humanitarians and want to provide healthy food that is nutrient dense for you know all the people of the world. No, they want to provide healthy food that's nutrient dense to the people who can afford their price gouging. And people may say, "Oh, that's over the top. That's so harsh, Mark." That's how it really is, folks. And if you don't think so, again, you're super naive. You you aren't really looking at what's there. You're looking at what you want to see there. Go to the motivation behind it. If the motivation was truly humanitarian, if it truly wanted to help people, they would find ways to bring their prices down and make it available to the people who really need it. Like people in the big cities and inner cities who are eating junk food because they can't afford to shop organic. And yes, that is legitimate. When people say, I can't afford it, it's legitimate. I tell people, yeah, it's worth investing a little bit more money. But hey, if you're going to come back with five times less the amount of food, 
you know, people are going to make the decision to say, I, got, I just have to go with the, the lesser quality stuff because I just don't have the money to shop like that. I would, they'd like to, but they can't afford it. And that's because this price gouging goes on unabated because these people who are the producers and the growers know that they have people by the balls. They know it. And don't let them tell you otherwise. That, oh, woe is me, the poor farmer who has to keep my prices at rape, anal rape levels, okay? Woe is me, I'm the one who's oppressed. No, you're the one who's gouging people, okay? Because you know you have no competition and people have nowhere to turn for better food. So they either have to come to you or they have to decide to poison their body and eat, eat crap. That's the bottom line. And that's really all I wanted to say about the state of organic food. Which I'm not really even talking about the food itself. I'm talking about the social dynamics of eating organic. And I, I think you can tell I'm a little bitter over this. Because the plan is to starve people out. Folks, that's what the plan is. The plan is to starve the body of nutrition so that people can't expand their consciousness and understand what's going on. And that's what will happen to the brain when it's fed a diet of poison and of a lack of nutrient-dense foods. So... My, the bottom line on all of this is get out of this naive mindset that these farmers are actually your friends. They worship their god called Mammon. That's their god. I don't, they want to tell you, look, let's put it this way. If, if it was so impossible to make organic prices, you know, reasonable, why can I go to an, orga an Amish farmer's market, pick up organic produce for totally reasonable prices? But if I go two blocks down the street to a supermarket, I could get a similar item that's organic, probably grown with the same methods, and it's three times the price. You want to explain that to me? No, no one can explain it. Because the answer is, it's price gouging. Pure and simple. It's the love of money. These people's God is mammon. The almighty dollar. They're not really there to help you. I, I talked about this briefly before when we went into food and even food as a solution. When we talked about all the negative consequences of you know the the Western diet and you know the whole uh, you know poisoning chemical poisoning of our food, and then we went into solutions and uh, about organic food, etc. I briefly mentioned this there and told people don't think these people are all out for your interests because they're all about the buck. That's it. You know, I mean, the only thing I could say is support local farmers markets that have somewhat reasonable prices and sell organically produced food. Talk with them about how they make their food. I guess that's the best bet, but you have to go hunting different farmers markets, finding them. Especially in winter, it can be difficult. The the market I'm, I was talking about where Amish come in from outside Philadelphia and set up uh, about a block away from here, they don't do that in the winter. So it, it's, it's even more particularly... Uh, strenuous to find organic produce at decent prices during the winter season than it is during the rest of the year. And again, people will say, grow your own. Well, I don't have the kind of money to set up a garden, and I don't have the kind of green thumb to grow through the winter in a small backyard in, in South Philadelphia, in, in the concrete urban jungle. I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, I understand if you're very, you know, suited to gardening and I want to learn more about it and I'm open-minded to learning more about it as well. Uh, Barb does a bit better than I do with, you know, uh, having a green thumb and, and gardening techniques. But, uh, you know, I don't have land that I can just crack open and, and go plant stuff. And you could say, oh, you can grow in barrels. Yeah, well, that's also extraordinarily expensive, getting all that soil, getting all those seeds, etc., and, you know, put, you know, putting the time and energy every day into doing that, and especially making it work in the winter. What does, you know, you're much more limited to what's going to grow in the winter climate. So, again, I'm not a farmer. That's not what I want to spend all my time doing right now. I want to deal with farmers who produce good food, 
organically grown and will charge reasonable prices not price gouge so you know any suggestions to that I'm open minded and I'll just I guess leave that you know part of the podcast at that the uh, second thing that I wanted to transition into talking about was something called planned obsolescence it's something I haven't really touched upon too much I haven't really gotten into technology much at all. We should do a couple of shows just on technology and you know my take on a lot of different things because uh, it's something I know a bit about and uh, you know could even pro- I, I mean I know so much about computers I could probably uh, you know do a whole podcast of uh, advice on uh, you know on computing in general and you know suggestions and you know. Uh, troubleshooting and technical support, etc. That's what I did for a living in the past. But I want to talk about the concept of planned obsolescence. And this is designing things with a planned lifetime in mind after which the, the device is designed to wear out or break just so people can go and have to get another one, get something new, or get the next model. And there's really no need for this. There's no necessity for it. It's just designed to do that, so you have to throw this one away and get a new one. Planned obsolescence. And this came up because over the last... The the reason this has really kind of come up in my life and is something that has basically continued to come to my attention so much that I said I have to talk about this in a podcast coming up is because over the last year to year and a half I have uh, re- recently completely re-outfitted my home with all LED or light emitting diode light bulbs. There is every light bulb in my house now is an LED um, energy efficient bulb and you know th- th- there was a lot of work into looking into the, the right type of replacements because I wanted to go to a energy efficient style. I definitely did not want to go to compact fluorescent, what they call CFL bulbs. These are poisonous. These are ho- horrific um, uh, energy emitters, uh, the, the type of energy that they emit. Yeah, they're more energy efficient than the standard uh, compact uh, than the standard uh, incandescent bulbs but the frequencies that they emit are poisonous to the human physiology Uh, they contain mercury inside the bulb that is very dangerous uh, particularly as a vapor if the bulb is smashed on the floor if it falls and hits a hard surface the vapor that comes out of it is poisonous even possibly deadly and you know I just don't recommend them based on the technology is inferior to LED. There's dangerous toxic substances in them, and the uh, frequency field that they output is just toxic. It's poisonous. I mean, I had a couple of them in in this house years ago, and just got rid of them all. You know, just immediately was able to recognize that these are just bad news, and just toss them. I went back to regular incandescence until I researched LEDs a little bit more. And, you know, this is a good uh, example of planned obsolescence when it comes to the incandescent bulb. Many people don't know that a meeting, uh, an actual documented conspiracy was convened in the 1920s to keep light bulb hours, incandescent light bulb hours, down to a specified minimum. They used to make them 2,500 hours and and even greater in many instances. And this cartel of light bulb manufacturers got together and actually met to say, we need to reduce this time because we're not selling enough bulbs. We need to have the turnover time faster for our bulbs. So they said, well, we'll make the filaments out of substandard materials or make them thinner so that they will wear out after 1,000 hours, turning the bulb on and off. Filament breaks after about 1,000 hours of usage, and you got to get a new bulb. Planned obsolescence. So, you know, um, having... I'm the kind of person who... 
I, I hate having to do things that make me continue to deal with the physical world when I know we need to place more emphasis and time onto our spiritual awakening. I want things in the physical as out of my way as possible. You know, when I deal with technology, I want it to work. I want it to be out of my way. I want it to be available when I, when I need to pick it up and use it as a tool and then put it down and have it be out of my way, out of my life. I hate having to go and spend more time on technological tasks than I need to. I have things I want to be doing with my time productively and not wasting time replacing light bulbs and having to get up in ladders and change them every couple months. I'm not interested in that. I want to, when I buy things, I want to buy things, if I'm going to invest money in buying something, I want to buy something that's going to be built to last. I don't want to be gouged for something because this person doesn't want to build it properly and they just want to build it out of substandard materials and just reinforce the take, make, and throw away society, which is not only morally irresponsible and it's, it's, it's basically totally immoral toward the, cons the, the, the customer. I, I almost said the word consumer. I hate that word. Uh, it's morally irresponsible toward the customer. We're not consumers. We're your customers. Get it right. Um, but it's, it's also immoral toward the earth. Because you're, you're, you're knowingly taking resources from the earth at a premature time when you don't need to be replacing those. When it can be made better and last longer. But no, again, the God is mammon once again. The God is money. People don't care about other people. They don't care about morals. They don't care about the earth. They care about worshiping their God that dollar bill, that piece of paper, that's their soul. Their God, their soul, their re reason for being. Which ultimately makes someone a total piece of trash. If that's your God, that's the essence of your soul, and that's your reason for being, you're a total piece of trash. If money is what you're about. And nothing else. And that's that's just everything you live for. And breathe for. It's the, the entire problem with this world are people like that. With no actual values. The value, when they think of the word value, they only see a dollar sign. They don't have any real values. No principles. So, I, again, recently completely re-outfitted the house with nothing but LED bulbs. There's no bulb in this house that is not an LED. I'm sorry, there is one. <laughs> the, the, we have a lava lamp, an old school 70s style lava lamp, an original one. And of course that needs heat, so there is an incandescent bulb in that one, but that's about the only one left in this house. They're all LED. And I had to do a lot of research to understand the LED technology and to uh, you know make sure you get the right color temperature for the bulbs because if you try to replace them a lot of these have you know you can get cheaper ones and they just are hideous in the color frequency that they output because the color temperature is way too high the sweet spot with the color temperature for people who uh, you know just want a little bit of, of advice and I highly recommend the LED bulbs especially omnidirectional LEDs over um, you know these horrible CFL compact fluorescent bulbs you, you want to steer clear of those um, 2700K, maybe up to 3000K color temperature. You don't want to go above that. You go above that, you're into hues that do not look like incandescent lighting. 2700K is definitely where, where you want to be at if you're going to be trying to replace a standard incandescent bulb with an LED bulb. And that's what I did for this house. You know, and uh, I bought decent bulbs. I didn't buy cheap crap. You know, each bulb that I replaced in here, I spent $10 on. And some of them, for the omnidirectional ones, I spent $20 to get those. And people will go like, wow, you spent that much money on, on light, a light bulb. Well, the light bulbs I bought are going to last 30 years. They're not, they're not made for planned obsolescence. They're made to last. LED technology is built to last. And actually, if you really look into it, they last even longer than that. The brightness will dim. 
to an extent after a certain amount of years. But guaranteed, LEDs are so long-lasting if you study what the technology is. I guarantee these bulbs will be burning longer than 30 years, some of them. So, yeah, I'm willing to pay a premium when it comes to something like that because, one, it's not planned obsolescence. I can put it in and forget about it. And I'm done with that. I don't have to think about that aspect of the physical world. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there is enough aspects of the physical world that we need to deal with on a daily basis. From cleaning our bodies, to cleaning our cars, to f nourishing our, our bodies, to uh, you know, cleaning our homes, you know, to, to putting gas, gasoline in your internal combustion engine vehicle, since we don't have free energy technology, unfortunately. You know, all, all of those things that you have to deal with on a daily basis, the entropic nature of matter, you know, just accumulating, you know, detritus and, you know, dust and debris, etc., just cleaning, dusting. I, you know, I don't want an additional thing to be concerned about. What I can simply take care of and, you know, have it work permanently, or at least for a semi-permanent basis, you know, I might have to buy one more set of LED bulbs in my lifetime if I, if I'm still in this house, you know, and and you know uh, a total shit hits the fan situation doesn't happen and war not erupt in this country during my lifetime, you know, or or some something else, you know, if I do happen to live to to somewhat of an old age, I may have to uh, replace the the bulbs in this house one more time. And by then, I guarantee you these bulbs will be down, by that year, if we're all still here, these bulbs will be down to a dollar, uh, you know, a dollar fifty a light bulb, if that. So, my point here is, uh, you know, people will say, well, isn't that price gouging? No. It's a new technology, okay? These are people who are interested in putting out something that is better for the environment, less energy expenditure, saving people money on their electric bill. They're made to last. And think about how many bulbs you would go through in 30 years. You'd go through a minimum of 30 bulbs. Most bulbs aren't going to last over a year. Minimum, let's say minimum 30 bulbs. That's 30 entire light bulbs. All the metal, all the glass that had to be, you know, manufactured. The shipping of all of those bulbs to to stores, me having to use fuel to go in, to the store and get it and bring it back to the house, etc. Add that up for all the bulbs in the house. And then look at the environmental impact on something like that. So, I'm totally a supporter of LED technology. And I'm, I, you know, I'm not even going to you know, throw out any brand names. I'm not... This isn't a commercial. I'm just explaining... This is an example of the opposite, the antithesis of planned obsolescence. This is what technology should be about, making something to last, building something that is good for humanity, that is good for the environment, that helps save money, save money for people. Yeah, it's a little bit of an initial investment, but you know, every single light bulb in this house, I could put my palm directly on, and there's no heat dissipation. You know, I could touch every bulb. You try doing that with an incandescent bulb, you'll blister your finger up. I had xenon bulbs in a lighting fixture over our sink. And I didn't make the choice. That was done by, uh, when we were setting up the house, the electrician who wired it happened to choose that fixture. And, we, you know, went, went with it. I replaced the whole fixture because, you know, there was no LED replacements for these xenon bulbs. For $40, I got the fixture replaced. But, I mean, th those bulbs were so hot. If I put my hand up to that fixture, I could get a second degree burn. That's how hot those bulbs burn. So you can imagine how energy inefficient they were. With the replacement I put up there, I could keep my hand on it all day. <laughs> You'll never even feel any heat at all. Totally cool to the touch all day, no matter how long it's burning for. If you haven't looked into it, I highly suggest checking it out. You know, again, 2700K is the uh, color temperature if you're going to approximate the lighting that comes out of an incandescent bulb. And uh, 
you know, you want to also look for dimmability if you have them in a fixture that supports dimming, if you have it on a dimmer. So, what kind of put me onto this is I was talking to people about what I was doing, uh, you know, and I even asked the electrician who wired the house, hey, do you think this is a good idea what I'm doing? And you know what his answer was? Absolutely. He said, does it make less work for me? Yeah, it does. But I, I'm all for it because it saves people money. They don't have to go and replace the bulbs. These are built to last. The light is just as good as incandescent lighting. Anyone who comes in this house would not be able to, would not know that I have LED bulbs. They would think it's standard incandescent bulbs throughout the whole house. Until I tell them they're LED bulbs, they would never even think to ask. That's how exact the light that comes off of these are. Okay, and I, I counted it up. I had in the main living room area of this house, I had an incandescent wattage over 700 watts going through one room with all the bulbs and the way that the fixtures are in, in, the, in the, the living room of my house on the first floor. After replacing them with LED, it is just over 100 watts in the same room. And the same light, the same actual approximate lumen uh, rating or light uh, availability is in the room for about 100 watts. That's seven times less electricity being used on a daily basis. It's a no-brainer. A no-brainer. So, you know, when, in, in having conversations with people, different people were, were, you know, expressing different sentiments to me. You know, an electrician said, this is the way to go. You're doing the right thing. I think it's great. Which I thought was very encouraging. Especially, that's his field. You know, he gets paid for doing stuff like this and replacing things like this often. He's like, yeah, it'll be less work for me in the long run, but I totally am behind it. Which I thought was awesome. You know, and then I talked to some other people and they're like, well, I'm just not going to pay $10 for a light bulb. Period. I don't care how good it is. And I was just like, that's, you know, like such a closed-minded approach. You didn't even look at the technology or see what it's about. Or see what it can save you in the long term. Because all people are about is the short term. This affects me like this in the short term. I don't care how good it is in the long term. You know, just like the changes we need to make in respect to our thinking, they're going to have a long-term effect on human freedom. Oh, they don't want to do that because it involves a little bit of shake-up in the short term. God forbid anything be disrupted in the way I live my life in the short term. doesn't matter whether I lose my freedom and my children lose theirs and my grandchildren lose theirs and my great-grandchildren lose their freedom. No, that doesn't matter. All that matters is me, me, me in the moment. Yeah. So, you know, talking to some people about it, I just got the, this total other reaction. And it's like, you know, okay, you bought three bulbs here for the, you know, these fixtures, and they were 20 a bulb. Yeah, I spent, oh my God, I spent $20 for a light bulb. Yeah. But that light bulb's going to last 30 years. You know? And save a whole lot of uh, additional resources from being, you know, dug up from the earth and, and you know, put, put forward and, re and then have it be recycled, etc. And having to be shipped and trucked and, you know, wastes of energy when, when, they're, when they're actually plugged in and lit. To me, it's a no-brainer, you know, thinking about the savings, both financially and ecologically. Not a no-brainer. But other people, they have that short-term approach only. What, what's this going to do for my you know, situation just right now in the short term? And they wouldn't even bother. Like, I didn't do it all at once. It's not like I did this all in one day. I did this in sections. I said, well, here's some fixtures here. You know, on the ceiling, I have some uh, recessed fixtures. Oh, let me replace these six. You know, there's six recessed fixtures in the area where I do the show, in the room where I, I, I do my show out of. Let me get those six. You know, let me replace the kit, the ones up above the, the, the fixture in the kitchen. I'll do those. I did it in, in, in increments, in sections. So it's not like you have to do it all at once. 
just like with any other type of change. I didn't replace, you know, I didn't go vegetarian all at once. I didn't replace all the incandescent bulbs in this house all at one time. But it's just even just suggesting a small change to people. It's just there's it's so alien and foreign to them. And this is what this is what the government is planning on when they because they're going to make the old incandescent bulbs illegal. They're going to actually take them off the market and say you can't get them anymore at some point. I think starting next year. This is going to push all these people toward the least common denominator. The cheapest thing they can get their hands on, which is the compact fluorescent bulbs. Which are toxic, poisonous, emitting horrible frequency fields. But... Oh, they're a little bit cheaper than the LEDs. You can get them for, you know, a dollar or two. Well, people not wanting to spend that extra $8 or for a good omnidirectional LED in some instances that you may need for certain situations if you don't have recessed lighting on your ceilings, you know, to get the, the omnidirectional ones that are comparable to the, the um, light pattern of a traditional incandescent you might need to spend about 19 or 20 bucks and you know people are going to you know have a knee-jerk reaction to that cost and they're going to go run out when they no longer have access to the incandescent bulbs because guaranteed they won't stock up on those and they'll go and get the compact fluorescent bulbs which is exactly what they want you to do because again this is all about undermining the health that's what it's all ultimately about. Undermining the health through frequency fields. And that's what these compact fluorescent bulbs will do. Just look them, look up the data on that. It is out there in abundance how bad these things are. Understand about this technology now. Because, you know, I think people should be really looking at LED technology. It's there. It's ready. It's ready for prime time. And like I said, I'm not endorsing any particular company. Go do your own research. I'm not, this isn't a commercial for, you know, any particular LED manufacturer. I'm just saying this is a technology that I happen to like. And I think it's, it is something that's good. Be, for the very reason that it's not based on planned obsolescence. And when I was trying to tell people about planned obsolescence, it was like, well... Aren't you mad at all? And, and see, I, I wanted to replace the incandescent bulbs in my house. Not with compact fluorescent, but with LED, because I recognized that all of these, a long time ago, knew that all of these light bulb manufacturers were all about just keeping the hours down to a minimum so that they could profit. I learned years ago about a light bulb that has been burning in the United States for over a hundred years. It's in uh, just outside of San Francisco, California, in a firehouse. A, a, an incandescent bulb manufactured in, I believe it was um, in the late 1800s, and it was used in the early 1900s. I think it was 1901. It's still burning 112 years later. 112 years, ladies and gentlemen, an incandescent bulb built in the late 1800s is burning in a, in a California firehouse for 112 years. Uh, yes, you did not mishear what I said. Look it up. It's called, they call it the centennial bulb. Okay? And this is proof of the conspiracy, the outright open conspiracy by light bulb manufacturer cartels. They, I believe, believe they called this the Phoebus cartel. And Osram and Phillips were the main people behind that cartel. And they decided to get together and say, we have to reduce the quality of the material that we make these filaments out of so that they will break after a specified amount of time. And they set the specification to 1,000 hours and find any members of their cartel, the manufacturing facilities, that were manufacturing bulbs that exceeded 1,000 hours. And a there's a great video on this, actually. Uh, I came across this uh, about a month ago. It's called The Light Bulb Conspiracy. Very well done documentary on this very concept of planned obsolescence. Very well done. I'll, I'll post it with the podcast, as a matter of fact. But people have to check out the light bulb conspiracy to understand 
what planned obsolescence is and how it works in our world and start looking for ways to circumvent planned obsolescence. Don't put up with it. Uh, one of the ways I don't put up with it is I no longer use incandescent bulbs. I switched all to LED. I don't have to replace any light bulbs in this house for 30 years. I'm quite proud of that, personally. You know, that, that's one extra way I get my attention off the physical world and put it where it needs to be on bringing the deep moral lessons of spiritual life, of the higher life, to people. And I don't have to be as focused on the physical tasks of everyday life to the extent that I may have before. Of course, there's many other aspects of physical life that do demand attention, but that's one less. And that's how I look at it. So, um, you know, when I was talking to people about this conspiracy that is open and documented, you know, and not denied whatsoever, you know, and saying, well, how does that make you feel? They deliberately could have built this out of better materials, made it available for the same prices. You wouldn't have to replace light bulbs as much. They could even maybe even make it more energy efficient and longer lasting. And yet, you're basically being taken advantage of. They're telling you, no, we want you to give us more of your money on a more frequent basis. We don't care really care about you as a customer. And, you know, the, the majority of the reaction that I got from just asking people that, once showing them that there is a documented conspiracy about light bulb life, incandescent bulb life, I don't care. I don't care. Whatever. See, to me, that's... It, there, there, there's so much to that, that. That somebody could just... That's their reaction. It tells me you don't really have any self-respect. You, you like being taken advantage of. That's the first thing it tells me. Is that deep down inside, you don't really deeply like yourself. And you could say, oh, you're blowing this into something bigger than it is. No, I'm not. Psychologically, that's what you're saying when you say, I don't care to something like that. I, I don't really like myself. You know, I'm not saying, you know, go and develop some skill, you know, that, that requires enormous effort. I'm saying, how do you feel about being taken advantage of? You know, to say, oh, well, you know, you don't have self-esteem because maybe you don't want to develop, a, you know, an interest in the arts or music or something. You know, somebody might not want to actually put that level of work into something that they don't feel deeply and strongly about. But when it comes to being beaten for something, being taken advantage of, for example, you know, being seen as a consumer instead of a customer that should be treated with respect... This can only happen if the person doesn't have respect for themselves and then keeps going back to the same people who are doing this. So when I was replacing light bulbs in the past, it was wearing on me because as someone with self-respect, I was like, why should I have to keep replacing these this frequently? I intuitively just knew they can make these out of better materials. They deliberately made, I knew that they deliberately made them to fail even intuitively before I even learned about the Phoebus cartel. So I'm sitting there thinking, this isn't something I want to continue to support. I want to support products. When I buy something, I want it to be made as well as it can be made. Something built to last. I don't want to go out and just buy a total piece of junk. That being said, I don't want to buy something that I have no usages for in the features. I'm not going to buy things with so many extra features, I'm never going to use it. Like, I didn't go out and buy a 24-channel board to do a little podcast. You know, to do a simple podcast with a microphone and maybe two microphones if I have a guest in studio. You know, I went out and bought something that's going to work, that's reasonable, that works well. You know, I didn't go out and buy a $5,000 Newman microphone. You know, I, I picked up something decent that, that was reasonably priced, better than the, the mic I was using before, that works well. So, you know, this ha it comes down to self-respect psychologically, ultimately. And when I hear the term, the phrase, I don't care, 
I just don't care. What that says to me is you really don't have any self-respect. Members of my family who I just, you know, said, hey, I replaced all, all my uh, light bulbs with LED, totally energy efficient, saving money on, on the electric bill every month, you know, <laughs> reducing the electric consumption in, in the house, at least by bulbs, by about a sixth or a seventh easily. And they're, they're just sitting there like slack jawed, like, I don't even want to hear anything about this. Like, because that might involve me learning something, having to look something up, learn about it a little bit for a few minutes, and maybe then go and invest a little bit of money into something new. I don't have time for that. I, I don't care about that. No, but you'll keep going and getting raped by someone who is just beating you because you don't know any better and don't think there's an alternative. And that's planned obsolescence. And that's exactly the mindset they want people in. I don't care. So, you know, I think I should do, like, maybe some memes. You know, like, put out some memes out there for people. Like, real simple phrases that people can latch on to, like a mantra. Because that seems to be what sticks in people's minds. And just keep repeating them over and over and over and over and over again. You know, the, the, the first one should be, I don't care creates a prison for everyone. There you go. How's that sound? I don't care creates a prison for everyone. That's the dynamic that's at work in the world, folks. You know, that phrase, I don't care, when that's uttered, that means I want to accept the very base minimum of the default settings of how reality is generated for me and everyone around me, and it immediately descends into entropy by saying that. I don't care. There's no ordering principles in I don't care. There's no true value in, in I don't care. There's no self-respect in I don't care. I don't care generates a prison for everyone. Not just for you, for all. Now let's put that on some t-shirts or on some Facebook memes. I don't care generates a prison. I don't care, in quotes, the phrase, I don't care. When that leaves your mouth, creates a prison for everyone. You know, we should do some real simple memes like that and keep hammering them into people. Not caring is what makes you immoral. There's another good meme. Not caring is what makes someone immoral. That's the definition of immorality, not caring. You don't care about social justice. You don't care about right from wrong. You don't care about the suffering that's taking place in the world. You don't care about the continued degradation of the environment. You don't care about any of it. Now, I'm not talking about carbon credit nonsense and, you know, uh, uh, climate change a la Al Gore. I'm talking about real environmental degradation and the real irresponsible use of the resources that come from the very a dynamic living energy system that is the earth herself and just pillaging that and plundering it that's what not caring does i don't care creates a prison for everyone not caring is what makes you immoral and this is the response i got from so many members of my own family and and, pe and people think people are waking up yeah, people are waking up, right. In some fantasy dream world that you live in, people are waking up. Instead of being honest about it, people are waking up. Because, people say people are waking up because in the little New Age circles that they live in, in their daily hovel uh, lives, in their bubble world, the other people that they interact with on a daily basis might happen to be semi-aware. And so they say, wow, the world is waking up. Just, you know, spend a day with me, and I'll show you how much the world is waking up. You know, go into the trenches of consciousness, you know. People are, are living on the outskirts of the town. They don't want to venture into the inner city. And they're, they're, they're looking at the world from the outside and going, Wow, that's pretty good. That shell looks pretty clean. And they're not going into the, the core that's all diseased and, you know, just completely degenerated. Now, they don't want to look deep into that heart, that blackened heart that is just all 
crumpled and wrinkled and ugly. Because then they might have to face reality and face what their work really is. They want to see the world through their little rose-colored sunglasses, you know? And they don't want to call people on their nonsense when they say, I don't care. They don't want to be confrontational. I don't want to be confrontational. You know, I want to make that person feel good. This is the problem with the whole New Age nonsense. It tells you that the goal of life is to feel as good as you can. Not to serve truth. Not to put the truth out into the world as in an unapologetic manner as possible. So that it can be heard by people. No, it's to feel good, don't you know? Your, ha your personal happiness is life's goal. That's your whole agenda. I mean, this is borderline hedonism, what they're teaching in New Age circles these days. And it's all nonsense. And then they teach people, don't call people on their nonsense. Oh, they have a right not to care. Uh, really? Because, oh, that doesn't affect my freedom or other people's freedom. So they can just continue to do that unabated. Them not caring about issues related to wrongdoing being committed against other people. Them not caring about, about the environmental d destruction that's being done. Well, see, these di types of dynamics that people say that they have a right not to care about, unfortunately, since we are connected and living in this, on the same planet, that dynamic is destroying other people's freedom, including my own. So I beg to differ with people that they have a right not to care. They don't have a right not to care. It's an immoral standpoint saying, oh, I just don't care about the loss of freedom. Well, newsflash, punk, you don't have a right not to care about that. Because you not caring about that is what's destroying my freedom and the freedom of other people who do care. And therefore, you are morally wrong for even daring to say about an issue like human freedom, I don't care. And again, just something like planned obsolescence is a microcosm within the realm of slavery, of things that keep us enslaved. But it's an important issue nonetheless, and it's a big pet peeve of mine that I can't stand and I think should be thoroughly rejected. It should never be accepted. It should be one of these things we refuse to accept and we should fight back against it at all times and places to the very best of our strength and, and knowledge. So I highly recommend the movie Lightbulb Conspiracy. And again, I'll post it with this podcast. And that's really all I wanted to say on planned obsolescence. And uh, hey, this goes on with so many other technologies too, folks. Believe me, light bulbs are the tip of the iceberg. I mean, they get into it in the, in the film with a lot of other technologies as well. So it's something pe just to put a seed there for people to think about. I'll post a couple of links, and I'll definitely post a link to that documentary film. It's a good one. Check it out. And with that uh, having been said, I think uh, I'll wrap it up right there for this uh, podcast. And say, everyone, thanks for listening. Um, definitely check out freeyourmindconference.com, the Free Your Mind 2 conference coming up April 25th, 26th, and 27th here in Philadelphia. Please, uh, again, um, visit Free Your Mind Conference on March 30th. We're having our last fundraiser. Advanced ticket sales. You have to have your, your ticket requests in the mail, postmarked by April 1st. April Fool's Day, that's it. That's the last day for advanced sales. After that, we're going to, you know, reg regular ticket sale prices at the door. That's it. No more advanced sale prices. You can only get them at the door after that. So, uh, please, get your tickets now. Helping us out in advance, that's the, it's the way to do it. Because we put up so much personal money. Uh, individuals. Like Michael Falsetta, who is the main, one of the main organizers of this conference. You know, without him, we wouldn't have this conference. You know, reaching into his own personal finances to, to help put this conference on. People are indebted to him. Okay? So, you know, a lot of people 
reach into their own personal wealth here to, to make this happen. You know, I, I just ask people, help give back to that effort a bit. That's all. Even if you can't make the conference, make a donation. Go to the website, hit the donate link, make a donation. Listen to uh, the fundraiser on March 30th, and please consider making a donation then. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll wrap it up right there. I'll see you here next time on What on Earth is Happening. Until then, folks, take good care.